Okay, so we're recording. So, salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, today's event is titled Muslim Identity and Mental Health Wellness of the Shia Community. And we have our two wonderful speakers here today who are going to be discussing this topic with us, inshallah. Okay, so our first speaker is Sister Vera Hussain. She is a registered psychotherapist practicing in a medical university clinic in Canada. She has a BA in psychology and a master's in educational counseling from the University of Ottawa. She's worked locally and internationally on a variety of mental health initiatives to break the stigma around mental health through TV documentaries, shows, and wellness programs with widows slash orphan charity groups in Iraq. Sister Vera continues to encourage people to reach their full potentials with the motto, Inspire, Heal, Empower. And um, inshallah, our second speaker is Sayyid Mahdi Al-Khazwini. Um, he's a native of Southern California and he has studied at the Islamic Seminary in Qum, Iran. After completing his undergraduate studies in Islamic studies, he returned to SoCal to pursue graduate studies at the Claremont Colleges. He currently serves as an Islamic educator in communities across North America and Europe, and also serves as a leadership consultant for a number of social nonprofit and business organizations. So before we get into, we're gonna have a Q&A panel discussion with our speakers. But before we get started, we just wanted to go over the purpose of the event and some rules. So the purposes are that we wanna discuss some key issues that the Shi'a community is facing in regards to mental health, to discuss how to build a strong sense of identity and to share a space where we can acknowledge each other's struggles and show support for one another. And just some ground rules, this is just common knowledge, but just be kind. Um, we wanna make sure that everybody feels included and that we are speaking respectfully to each other um, and also just being respectful in the chat. Yes, inshallah. So um, I'll stop sharing now and we can get into the questions. So these questions are gonna be addressed to both of the speakers. So whoever wants to answer them or however they wanna answer in whatever order, it's up to you both. Um, so for both of the speakers, um, for Sayyid Mahdi as a community leader and then for Sister Barak as a counselor, what do you see Shia Muslims struggling with the most regarding uh, mental health and identity? Uh, Sister Barak, would, would you like to go first, please? Oh, you're, I'm sorry, you're muted. Yeah. I was going to say, please, Sheikhna, you honor us first, Sayyidna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you to the organizers. Thank you for putting this together. And I'll be short. Uh, so um, what I see in, in my, my personal practice and in engagement involvement uh, with um, the Muslim community, specifically for, for Shia Muslims and, and others as well, is dealing with the concept of shame, the emotion of shame. And shame, uh, I heard one, one speaker say that if, if shame is, is driving in a car, then fear and guilt are always there with it. Uh, so it's not just the emotion of, of shame, but it's also uh, the underlying emotions that, that, tie un that tie into it. And from an Islamic perspective, some people have translated the word haya to mean shame. And that word haya appears both in the Quran and in the Hadith. And in my personal opinion, I think haya is, is a little bit more than shame. Um, but just for lack of, uh, you know, lack of proper wording, we'll, we'll define it as, as shame. Uh, haya in, in and of itself is a central part of our uh, Islamic moral framework. There's a narration from the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he says, khuluk wa Islam al -haya. Every religion has a distinguishing characteristic. And for Islam, that characteristic is shame. So it's part of our moral framework. However, uh, I, I think because of, uh, and again, this is just based on my assessment, my, my conversations with people when they talk about shame or fear or guilt, is because there is a lack of, um, uh, you know, uh, lack of knowing how to deal with your emotions, emotional intelligence, if you will. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't learn emotional intelligence in school growing up. If I picked up on emotional intelligence, it was because of observing the way that my parents behaved in certain situations. Um, and even then, you, you know, you you, uh, uh, you go through life and life sort of gives you a, 
if you're lucky, life gives you a masterclass in emotional intelligence. Um, but uh, because there is a misunderstanding of how to deal with shame, I think it, it's such uh, it's, it's a topic that a lot of people suffer with. Uh, I'll just give you a, a very quick rundown on shame from an Islamic perspective. Obviously, we mentioned the Hadith of the Prophet, and, and some scholars say that shame, um, there are three types of shame. So there's shame with oneself, there is shame in front of God, and there's shame in front of society. There's um, a beautiful, beautiful uh, supplication, Dua Abu Hamza Thumadi, for those of you who are familiar with it. It is from our fourth Imam, Al Imam Zain al Abidin Ali ibn Hussein, alayhi salam. And as I was thinking about this, this verse popped up in my mind, and I want to share it with you. And it's, it's where he says, "Ana ya Rabbi ladi lam astahika fil khala, wa lam uraqibka fil mala." He talks about two types of shame here. One is that, "O oh Lord, I, I did not have shame fil khala," which is khala means emptiness. So when I was by myself, uh, I did not observe any shame. And number two, "Wa lam uraqibka fil mala." Likewise, when I was in front of people, I did not observe any shame. So, so shame and the feeling of shame um, can be healthy if we use it as an indicator rather than as a dictator. And so for most people that I deal with, they use it as a dictator. You know, I'm, I'm shameful, I feel afraid, I feel guilty. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna stop coming to the masjid. I'm gonna stop coming to the events. I'm gonna stop showing up because of fear of exposure, because of fear that someone's gonna figure out or find out what I did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures us that, that, uh, that he has, that he is, and in the same, same dua, we read satar al ayub that he is, whatever we feel shameful about, that we think is going to lower our status in the eyes of people, that he will cover it, he will protect it, he will guard us against it if we have trust within him. So one of, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen that Shia Muslims deal with is shame and obviously it affects our mental health in, in many ways, but I'll leave it at that. I think that's a, a great segue to what I was going to say also, because when you have that shame, what does shame lead to? And you mentioned that, Sayyidina, in terms of people perhaps not going to the masjid after uh, being found out that they're Shia and they're going to perform all sorts of weird things uh, that beating themselves and crying and you know and so when people hear about that it looks like what one Sunni sister told me back in high school and university sounds like you guys are a cult. And right away, the word shame comes up. I recall that as a, as a high school university student feeling shamed, you know, being put in that position. So what does shame do? Shame then leads to isolation, alienation, exclusion. And all of these have a huge impact on our mental health, which then can cause other problems, right? And so I'll give you an example. I recall, and I know a lot of young people still experience this today. I hope it's not as it was back in my university days. But I recall joining all the MSA groups, all the Sunni Shia groups, just so excited out of high school to see all of these great groups that are doing amazing events, bringing in speakers from all around the world and educating people about Islam. And then there's a sense of pride, right? That, hey, look at us all working together. And so I would join all of these different groups, little knowing how others would look at me because in high school, we were both Sunni and Shia together making groups for our Friday prayers and we were all praying together and there wasn't this sense of animosity amongst us even though we had different identities we prayed differently with our hands down or we waited later to break our iftars things like that that kind of uh, differentiated us as high schoolers right when it came to our identities and I didn't find there was animosity until university came and I think a lot of us can maybe relate to that because once you hit you know, post-secondary education, you, you become challenged with looking at your worldview, your sense of self, your identity, your beliefs, your philosophy in life, your direction in life, right? Including your religious beliefs. So it's natural that you're gonna have these debates and you have to have knowledge, right? And then soon you realize, you know, your Imam Ali sword is not gonna do anything for you as a decoration or your, you know, your ring, that means nothing. People wear that as a form of identity to showing themselves of who they are, what they believe. But when you don't have that knowledge to have discourse with other people, then you're left with nothing, right? Except your belief in a broken heart. And I recall, even though I joined these groups open-heartedly, there was a pushback once people saw how I prayed in the prayer room next to them, or I, I delayed my iftar until later, so to speak. 
that pushback came in the form of unfortunately backbiting and telling new converts and other people stay away from the Shia, their kuffar. And the converts would come and tell us, you know, we were drawn to Islam because so many people spoke badly against it and we wanted to learn about it. It was drawn to Shia Islam because so many people spoke ill of it and I wanted to learn more about it. And I don't think you're a kafir just because you pray this way or you believe they become they became hardcore Shia afterwards when they did their own research. So you see with this simple story of discovery of learning how the other can view us, it could impact you. Definitely there was a sense of shame. There was a sense of what's wrong with me. There was a sense of feeling excluded that you are not a part of the other majority of the group, so to speak, right? So it becomes really disheartening when you see this type of behavior that pushes you away, excludes you, alienates you, which then can cause anxiety, which then can cause a sense of sadness and depression as well. Because if you are excluded, we know from psych psychological research, if people are excluded, then that will cause a sense of depression or anxiety or fear in terms of what are people thinking about us, like the Sayyid mentioned. Why am I mistreated this way? Because I have a different set of beliefs. So all of these, of course, impact your sense of well-being and your identity. And when we take a look at it in terms of what identity means, it essentially encompasses your memories, your experiences, your relationships, and values that creates the sense of self, right? And it's a combination or amalgamation of all of these that creates a steady sense of who you are over time, right? With new facets and new experiences that are developed. And so that's all incorporated into your identity. And so when you have this crisis, so to speak, it has to do with the questions of who am I? What am I? What is impacting me? Right, And we have different stages of development where we talk about these different identity crises. And if you are interested, check out Dr. Eric Erickson. He talks about the different stages of development and how we can develop identity crisis if we don't develop a certain part of our identity. Fascinating, but I won't get into it too much. But essentially what this is, is that you may face a challenge to your sense of self, whether it's religious, around politics, career choices, gender roles, and the list can go on and on and on. So when we apply it to what we're talking about this evening, absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely, it takes a look at what I see also personally when I grew up studying here, but also what I'm seeing now in the community. And Shala will get into more detail. I don't want to give too much away all at once. Thank you so much for your responses, both of you. And now going off of that, um, what are some ways that Shias can cope with those feelings of alienation, issues of identity and other mental health struggles? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, just going off of my own experience, um, as I was thinking about this question, I thought uh, one of the biggest identity crises that I probably faced in my life happened exactly 20 years ago on 9-11. Um, I was uh, 14 years old, and um, it was the second day of, of school going to an Islamic school, and uh, we were terrified that week. I remember it happened on a Tuesday, and we didn't go to school that entire uh, week, and it, it was scary, and I remember just not knowing who I was, uh, just having a complete loss of identity, just being completely confused, and you know, 14 years old, you're already confused about a million other things, and here comes this event um, that just that just shakes up the world uh, around us. And um, one, of, one of the things that I've felt as I've moved forward in terms of, um, you know, coping with feelings of uh, alienation and issues of identity is um, get, get, around, get around some people, get around some allies, get around some people who will listen to you. Um, you know, alienation and the feelings of loneliness is a very real thing. And I think it was in 2014 where the Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy, actually uh, said, he claimed that loneliness is um, not a pandemic. I think he said an epidemic or an endemic, one of, one of those terms. Um, you know, now we're more familiar with terms like epidemic and pandemic. And, but uh, he referred to it, and he's actually written a book about it. Um, it's, wasn't, he didn't say heart disease, he didn't say cholesterol, he didn't say smoking. He said it's loneliness because loneliness truly is that, that silent killer. Um, so get around other people. Um, 
there, there's, there's, you'd be surprised how many people actually want to extend a hand to you and listen to you. When we, when that first week happened after 9-11, um, we didn't know what the world around us was going to do. When we came back to school the next week, I'll never forget this. We found our Christian neighbors. Uh, there, were, there was a Christian community. It was um, a senior care living community, but it was Christian based. They showed up to the gates of our school, to the doors of our school, and they stood guard and they made sure that whoever was coming in was, uh, you know, a student, a, you know, family of the student or someone safe. They came to our doors, knocking at our doors, saying, look, if you're afraid to go out grocery shopping, give us the list. We'll go out grocery shopping for you. This is before the days of Instacart, right, where it's anonymous. We'll go out shopping for you. We'll escort you if you need to. So you'd be surprised. And I, I know it's it's, it's much harder said than done because when you're feeling loneliness, you're, that, that's the last thing that you're thinking about is reaching out. But there's always someone who's willing to lift you up. There's always someone who's willing to lift you up. So find a way to get around some really good people. And inshallah, on our end, we can do better to, to make communities more safe so that people who do feel alienated don't have to struggle with that sense of loneliness. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree in terms of working with allies, being with allies. And as uh, Sayyidina, you were describing your experience as a 14 year old, I'll, I'll give another example that was my identity Shia crisis, so to speak. And it was when uh, first, first year university, again, when I was around all the other groups and the, the Sunni MSA group had brought in a British speaker, a convert who I was just absolutely uh, amazed to see such a thing because we grew up seeing Iraqi scholars in front of us. So for me, it was like, wow, an English speaking speaker, you know, didn't really see that much back then. Now, mashallah, we have so much variety, but back then it wasn't. It was listening to the, the Ammu speaker in our community, right? Bless them. They were, they're the core of who we are today, which part of our identity, right? These majalis. So I was quite excited to hear a British speaker convert talking about Tawheed. And again, I was just in awe. It was in the university center in the atrium. It was open. Everybody could see going back and forth. And so at the end, we all went up to him and we didn't have the phones that we did now to record and, and do all that. I wish I did at the time because what he said really was a, a, contributing to that crisis, so to speak, that I experienced. And I think a lot of young people, Shaz, see this and I see this often where somebody had asked him, what do you think about Imam Hussein? And, uh, and he went off very negative. I don't remember what he said because I was in such shock, but he spoke very negatively about Imam Hussein. And I think the, the person who asked was somebody who had the name Hussein. So I'm assuming they were Shia and they were trying to ask the, the Sunni, obviously Sunni speaker, what did you think of Imam Hussein? And my response as somebody who hadn't really picked up books at this point and my knowledge was inherited from my Karbala'i parents living in the West kind of thing was this very innocent, but almost in defense, a, a very strong, but weak answer at the same time, weak in the sense I didn't have the knowledge from the books at the time, but strong and innocent at the same time when I said, but he's the grandson of the prophet. That in itself, we know is sufficient. You know, Hussein, he is of the prophet. Yet this answer wasn't sufficient in that moment against a scholar who was very well read and, and, and educated. And I couldn't speak back and defend, so to speak. And of course, there was that sense of shame. There was a sense of nobody else around me speaking up. And I remember looking at the brother that asked, he just kind of looked at me and looked away. And that's it. And I remember it was quite dramatic. I walked off and I felt that crisis. Like there was a conflict. Like, how are you supposed to respond to somebody like that? How can you, what does this mean to about myself personally when I don't understand what's going on? Why do people talk like that? And so that was the first big chism, sorry for the pun here, where, you know, I, I started pulling away from people saying, how come people think like that? But when we go through this type of crisis, what does it do? right? It teaches you. Teaches you, well, you need to educate yourself. That's when I started reading al murajaat That's when I started reading, um, if I remember, Peshawar Nights. That's when I started reading 
then I was guided, right? By Muhammad Tijani. Uh, no, no, I forget the name. Correct me, uh, Sayyidina Tijani, right? Yeah, I actually met him too, by the way. I, I met him um, when I was younger and I didn't quite make the connection until I was older. He had come to Canada before. So when you are faced with these types of situations where you're put in that position of shame, you're feeling alone, you're feeling isolated, then you have to weaponize yourself with your education, right? My mom always says that our degree, our books are our weapons, silah, right? Because when you educate yourself that way, then you can have an actual conversation back and forth. And sure enough, these books did help me. It also helped in terms of creating that sense of identity where you don't feel weak, like you don't know anything, right? It, it allows you to feel that, yeah, you know what? I have confidence now. That's when you build that sense of self. But I remember that afternoon after the, the lecture, I was walking outside campus in tears and just felt so lost within that moment of that identity crisis of who am I, what am I, what do I know? And then I came to that realization till today, X amount of years later, that no matter how much you learn, there's still so much more to learn and that's okay, right? The more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn and that's okay. So this is also protecting yourself is when you learn, you learn and you educate yourself mentally, how does that help you? Well, it empowers you with knowledge, right? Seek knowledge from, from uh, sorry, from the cradle to the grave, seek it as far as China. These are prophetic traditions that teach us about education. That is one of the ways of dealing with these types of situations. Also learn the opposite of what they are saying, learn their books as well. Learn from their hadith that when you have that discussion, you are using their sources to prove your point, so to speak, that builds up your confidence, right? Not in an aggressive manner, in an assertive manner, firm, calm in the way that our imams taught us. Now, so this is this is a personal experience that I've used over time and time again, personally, but I also advise my younger brothers and, and sisters in Shia Islam, you know, this is how you can kind of build yourself, your sense of confidence, right, through your knowledge. And just like Sayyidina said, is to align yourself with allies. You have allies from different backgrounds, like you have amazing people of different faiths that come and protect you as well in times of crisis like that, but also within your own groups. After that, I honestly had to pull away from the Sunni groups as I did not feel welcome. I felt, you know, pointed out, looked at strangely and, you know, naturally fell back into my Shia groups and my crew, so to speak. And it was easier to work with people who understood the same lingo, right? You don't have to explain why you did wudu this way or pray this way or wait till later for a thought or why you're wearing black in Muharram or certain nights of Layal al-Qadr, why you're wearing black. All of these things are understood. You get it, right? And so when you are around people the same, it's also good to have not just stick to Arafis, not just stick to Pakistanis, not just stick to Lebanese, but look at the beautiful variety of di diversity that we have within our faith as well, the different cultures, especially, for example, during Majalis. Have you been to a center other than your own? See how they, for example, perform Majalis and how they do their Majalis, their food and so on and so forth. It's an eye opener. And it's so beautiful to see how we connect in so many different ways for the love of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. That can also empower you to see that beauty of that diversity. I found that was very spiritually uplifting and helpful to see that it's not just, you know, from my household and that's it, or my community and that's it. There's so much out there. We're a big group out there, even though we're a minority within a minority of a majority, there's still a lot of power, right? And whoever said that, uh, you know, that saying the, the truth is a very lonely path, we know that, right? And, and so we have to stick together, but at the same time, still have the inter and intra faith type of connections with people because it's still important to learn about others, not just within our own. Although I have to say even within our own, sometimes we're clueless as to how other people do things and, and so on and so forth. So it's really important to keep that connection, right? When you educate yourself that way, when you look at what else is out there, that gives you a sense of empowerment, like we said, right? So these are just some strategies that I find is really helpful in terms of struggles with our identities to look at what else is out there and learn and grow from that. And I can tell you now in my community and traveling different parts of the world, what a blessing that is. I love to see the Majalis in English in Australia and England. It was an eye opener and I'm, I have to bring this to Ottawa. This has to happen here we, because the youth are missing out in terms of the actual language, it's hard to understand our mother tongue these days when, they're, when we're bombarded with other languages, right? The English language mainly. 
So when you have that connection to a speaker who gets your struggles, who uses the lingo uh, that you understand and, and the struggles that they've been through similarly to yours, I find that you can have a really good connection and that can empower your mental health as well because you're feeling confident, you're feeling pride, right? That you, there's no reason to feel ashamed here. There's no reason to you know, go aside and say, and feel depressed in the sense of, you know, there's a big X on us. Why do people hate us? Why is there so much hate? And realistically, and we're going to get into this in discussion, there is a lot of hate out there uh, on the Shias and different Muslims as well, right? The, let's be realistic. I, I'm not just sugarcoating it and saying, hey, you know, that's great when we connect like that. There's also this aspect as well that we have to be realistic about as well. Thank you both for those very well thought out and very um, educational answers. Um, the next question, I think this was touched upon a little bit, but maybe if you guys want to take a different route or go a little bit more into detail, but um, how can we as Shias and just as Muslims in general, how can we use our faith to help our mental health and to heal some of the wounds that we might have acquired? That's a great question. So um, one thing I will say is that uh, when we're talking about mental health, so we, there's mental health, there's physical health, right? There's emotional health and there's spiritual health. And all of them are intertwined. They don't exist in separate realities. Uh, you know, if you, if you do something that is detrimental to your um, physical health, right? That may very well affect your emotional and mental health. Um, Likewise, it can affect your spiritual health as well. This is why uh, as Muslims, we don't just lean into spiritual practices. You know, there, there were groups of people during the time of the prophet and the imams, uh, peace be upon them, that they would, they would just rely on spiritual practices and spiritual rituals. And the prophet and the imams, peace be upon them, would uh, forbid them or, or not forbid them, but they would not, they would not encourage that type of behavior. Uh, because you don't, as a spiritual wayfarer, for instance, you're not going to transcend your physical body, right? You're, you're still going to live within this body. So you have to take care of this body. Um, so, you know, one way to, to, to allow our, um, I, I guess, our faith, which kind of represents our spiritual health, uh, help and assist with our mental health uh, is just to realize that, uh, you know, don't, don't lean too much into one area where you're neglecting another area. You know, we know in terms of our physical health that uh, certain dietary choices, right? If, if um, th there, was a, there was a great book uh, called, I, I think it's called The Depression Cure by Stephen Alardi, where he talks about six or seven things that, that are, are proven that you can do that. that, that and I'm, I'm not speaking as a professional here. Just, this is just on the surface. Um, but six or seven things that you can do to, uh, to help uh, relieve, uh, you know, minor types of depression, which is what, you know, a lot of them have to do with our diet, omega-3 diet, uh, uh, sleeping um, enough, uh, getting sunlight, uh, having strong uh, social connections, uh, not ruminating, right? Uh, prohibiting yourself from, from, from ruminating, uh, which is, you know, getting into deep thoughts about negative things that happened in the past. Uh, so, and when you, when you, when you study uh, the Quran and the uh, tradition of the Prophet and the Imams, uh, salam, they didn't leave any aspects out, right? They, they always spoke about the importance of physical health, of mental health, of emotional health, and, um, and, uh, and spiritual health. Um, so in, in terms of our faith being used to help our, our mental health and our healing process, um, one thing I will say is understand that our entire existence um, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the verse that always strikes a chord with me whenever someone talks about certain emotions and how they feel is the verse that says, uh, Know that God comes between a man and his heart. Meaning that if we have feelings, if we're feeling a certain way that we don't like and it's weighing us down or bogging us down or whatever, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so within that, you're, you are basic, within that process, you're basically asking God um, 
which when you ask God, that is a, you know, that's a spiritual practice to intervene and help you with your, uh, with your mental health or with your emotional health, rather. Um, so uh, it's, it's just understanding um, that all of them are, are intertwined. Um, a great book on the subject, uh, and this is an Amazon bestseller, actually, it's, it's called The Secrets of Divine Love. Um, I would look that up and read that book. It was, it was um, uh, recently uh, printed a, a couple of years ago, actually, under uh, an anonymous pen name, but it's magnificently written. It's an Amazon bestseller, and it talks a lot about how to, you know, work with your spiritual and mental health, um, you know, and uh, develop that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really find healing because a lot of people are looking for healing in this world, uh, especially um, with, um, with what's happened in the past year with uh, virtual classes and virtual graduations. I mean, this is the first time that uh, I've, I've ex you know, we've, we've seen that happen, I know in my lifetime. And um, sometimes I think, you know, how do university students feel about this? Uh, is it something that affects them emotionally and mentally? Do they feel like they're missing out on something? And what can we do as a community to uh, help, you know, help help assist with that from, from a faith perspective? Thank you. I'd absolutely reiterate what the Sayyid was saying in terms of every point there. And just quickly on that, I'm actually dealing with students uh, who are graduating these days and they are saying it's not the same. They're not really feeling as excited. It doesn't feel like they're graduating because they're doing online graduation, which, uh, you know, before we had the actual physical graduation ceremony recorded and it was available for those families, especially international students where their families couldn't physically be here and they could watch it. So students would send that to me when they knew they wanted me to be there, but I couldn't be there. So I will watch them graduate this way. But now it's a reality for everybody. And of course it's had its huge impact on our, on our mental health. and. Uh, definitely when we talk about faith and mental health, these are all intertwined, like the say you'd said, I'm not going to repeat everything, but I just want to actually take a closer look here and look at what does mental health actually mean and the definition from the World Health Organization, the Canadian Mental Health Association, Association, it talks about that balance, striking a balance amongst all aspects of our lives, right, whether it's physical, whether it is a spiritual, financial, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you have that balance, then you can lead a relatively healthy life where you can contribute meaningfully to your society, right? If one of these things are off, then you're more likely to struggle. And that's what we talk about in terms of how to cope with mental health. Again, this is basic 101. I've done lots of workshops. You can find them on my YouTube channel. I'm not going to do all of that right now in these few seconds, but it is what the say it said. It is about that balance. You're eating, sleeping, exercise, your family relations, spirituality. And when those things are often you're hit with a difficult situation, then it becomes really challenging to deal with. Whereas, especially in situations where things are out of your control, a lot of things are, right? And especially with what we've seen this year, the pandemic. So rather than dealing with that frustration and not knowing how to cope and deal with it, well, let's go inwardly here and look at what can I do to balance in terms of maybe my sleep is off, my diet is unhealthy, I'm not exercising, there's a built up of stress hormones in my system, the cortisol, where is it going to go? People tend to have, let's say, uh, predispositions to different illnesses, perhaps, right? Or mental health illnesses, family history of that. So if you're more prone to anxiety or depression, when let's say your stress levels go up, then it could exhibit itself in the form of depression or anxiety if that's what you are prone to. I'm the type that is prone to anxiety. I get really anxious and stressed out and I lose my appetite, just constant worrying. Um, it's great to lose your appetite once in a while, right? But the pandemic has proven that our fridges are our best friends, right? We've been stress eating. But, but you need to understand how your body responds to stress, which is why I openly say my stress response is anxiety. I've learned that over the years. Sleep, stomach issues. It's really important to understand how you respond to stress so that you can manage it. Otherwise, if you don't take care of it, then it could lead to other serious illnesses, physical as well as emotional and mental. Now, when we look at faith here, Right. And I'll give you this beautiful example of Imam Musa al-Kadhim, which I use extensively when I talk about mental health and Islam. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he teaches us to divide our time into four. Right. Part to God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, part to our families, part to our like friends and families, work and to ourselves. 
And the idea here, it goes to the definition of what mental health is, right? Striking that balance amongst all aspects of your life. And I love how Imam Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salam beautifully exemplifies how we use faith to balance our mental health. Now, I did a research uh, recently in the last two years on the question, how does the ziyara, for example, the ziyara pilgrimage of the Arba'in impact your mental health? And looking at it from a psycho-spiritual perspective, we found that there was quite a few studies done from not per, per se specifically Islamic studies, but Christian-based studies, other uh, faiths, the idea of spirituality, how it impacts us. And the role that religion and spirituality plays has a significantly positive impact on our life. Now we see also in the research from, for example, the Muslim ment mental health journals out there, you have conferences, you have more professionals being trained in the field. You know, I empower that and I support that because at the time when I was studying, doing my graduate studies, and I specialized in Islamic counseling theories and practice, there was hardly anything. I had to use very loosely translated books and really badly translated books. I had to do a lot of qualitative type of research where I was speaking to scholars and alimas as opposed to looking at hard evidence of research base. But now, mashallah, we have so much more of that, right? So I know I went off track here a little bit and probably went into the next questions, but essentially what we want to take a look at, and I encourage you um, to check out that research and it is document in a documentary that we have on the Muslim Counselor YouTube page where it's a whole hour long, which is why I'm not gonna get into it here. But for those of you who are interested in looking at this research in terms of how does the ziyarat al-arba'in or the, the spiritual experience impact our mental health? We did interviews with people around, of course, beautiful imagery and sounds of that. And for those of us who couldn't go this past year because of the pandemic, this certainly was something that was off, off track here a little bit, but it is related, I have to say. It took me two years to get this project done because I couldn't find the right team that could uh, produce what I was envisioning in terms of how I was hoping that people could see this the way I was envisioning. And alhamdulillah, subhanAllah, look how you plan something and you want something. It doesn't go that way, but Allah has another plan for you. I wanted this out two years ago, but Allah wanted it out this year during the pandemic. And it was because we couldn't go. A lot of us couldn't go. And we were feeling homesick for Karbala and the Ziyara. And subhanAllah, this documentary came out at a perfect time in the sense that we actually aired it the day of Arba'in right after on Ahl Bayt TV. And then it, it was available after for people where it does explore that in more depth. So I hope I've encouraged you to want to watch and learn more about that and look at the connection of spirituality, mental health and faith. And like I said, this is something in my own practice, in my own research that I did, where I, I did focus on that topic, um, Islamic counseling theories and practice. But again, it was nothing back then that uh, I could do much more in terms of over the years, how it's developed and what research is out there now. And especially in practice, when I have clients that come in of a faith background, not necessarily Muslim, not necessarily Shia, but who use faith and spirituality in their lives, when we take a look at using spirituality to help heal and help with their challenges, you find that there's so much more impact in their lives, a positive impact. So well, absolutely, right. absolutely okay. there's a- I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm in? doing this right because- Anyhow, so I'll leave that to the moderators to mute the theory. sound there. Uh, but in any case, to sum it up, absolutely, there's a connection with faith and spirituality and our mental health. And the research shows that there is a positive impact. Thank you so much both for those wonderful tips and resources uh, for mental health. And now looking at it from a bigger perspective, um, how, how can we as a larger Muslim ummah create an environment of healing between our communities? That's a great question. And uh, the one thing I will say is number one um, is uh, destigmatize uh, talking to mental health professionals. I was having a conversation with, uh, with my father a while and we ha we've had this same conversation many times over that in the same way that in our masajid, we have the imam, we have the assistant imam, we have the secretary, we have the media person, we have uh, the, the keeper, right? The, what we call an alaku, the farash, right? We, we, have, we have people in the kitchen serving, uh, you know, we have security guards. One of the essential, I think, one of the essential pillars of every Muslim community is a mental health professional. Now, whether they're full-time, part-time, pro bono, you have to start with something. 
and destigmatize it, have conversations around it. Um, I'll tell you what, being just being religious or spiritual does not protect you from depression. And you can ask Sister Barak about this. I'm sure she's come across many cases where people are super devoted to their religion and their spiritual practices, but they are suffering, really, really suffering from depression and, and anxiety and um, you know uh, those challenges. I remember myself 10 years ago, 10 years ago, it was around 2011, 2012, uh, where I was you know, going through a, a very low time in my life. And um, it was it was very hard to be around people. If you can imagine, I was about 20 pounds lighter than what I what I am right now. And uh, I was I was I was really struggling. And the thing that I was thinking in my mind is, who do I reach out to? Like, people reach out to me, but who do I reach out to? And I and I, I remember just wishing at that time that I had someone to have a conversation with. Obviously, I didn't have any um, friends or colleagues that were uh, counselors now I do and as soon as something comes up I have a conversation with one of them um, but destigmatize it have the conversations around it uh, and provide resources you know as as an MSA as a group or as a masjid leadership or as a community provide resources I think there is um, a group called uh, if I'm not mistaken Nasiha mental health and uh, if I'm not mistaken they provide a free one of their services is they provide a hotline a free anonymous hotline uh, for people who are struggling, you can call them, make that resource available. I talk to so many young people and they don't even know about that resource. And that's just one out of many resources that are available. If you can, you know, we spend so much money on uh, gym training sessions. We spend so much money on the, the uh, subscriptions that we have. Uh, you know, I look at the subscriptions and I'm like, why do we have, four? You know, I asked my wife, why do we have four YouTube red subscriptions. Like, did you subscribe on every single account that we have? You know, so it's, so it's, um, we have, you know, we, we pay, we pay for so many things. Why don't we, uh, if we see someone struggling, why don't we offer to, to pay for sessions for them to go see a mental health therapist counted as a form of sadaqa, sadaqa jariya. You know, if you help someone get on the right track, um, and, uh, you know, it, it unlocks so many possibilities, uh, in, in that person's world. Um, you know, they, they say that an ounce, is prevent, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And um, I, sometimes I think to myself, you know, if only this, this person or this community did not see mental health as such a stigma, uh, that how much healing could actually take place. And, you know, for us in our community, um, one of our... Um, one of our events that we conduct on a yearly basis, obviously we, we couldn't this year in the summer and last year because of the pandemic is our annual youth camp. That youth camp, bringing people together, having them stay at a resort for two or three days, waking up for Fajr together, going out on hikes. Uh, it, it, there's, so much, there's so much healing in that community. Sometimes, uh, most of the time actually, we'll, we'll invite a mental health professional to, to spend time with us and have conversations with us one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it's, a, it's a spectacular thing, but it starts, in my opinion, with destigmatizing the conversation. Everything after that is possible. Thank you. You know, Sayyidna, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was invited to that camp last year. You were. That the one, was that the one we're, same one we're talking about? Yes, yes. Now I remember. You reminded me. Yes, you were. Yes. And as soon as we open it up, uh, back up, uh, we'll have you. We'll have inshallah, you. With inshallah, inshallah. Our youth are very fond of... of you and um, you know you've you've been a guest with our youth as well before, so uh, inshallah we'll we'll have that uh, soon. Uh, inshallah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, you know the the borders will open up and we can travel again. And definitely, that's part of the healing. It, I I actually looked at the question in a different way, but I, I'll I'll add to what you were saying absolutely, and I reiterate and support and I've also been saying this for years that every single center that we have needs to have a mental health professional on staff if not an actual room where people can feel safe to go and talk to somebody where they can trust that it's confidential because confidentiality in our community is just terrible let's just say it as is right so there's a fear of whatever you tell the sheikh well with all due respect to our said here that it's going to go to the sheikh's wife and then the rest of because it's happened we know it has right sometimes people prefer to go outside of the communities because of this issue or they want to talk to somebody who doesn't know them because there's that sense of shame no matter how much so the destigmatization is a huge long process that we all need to work on but 
let's be honest also, look at how far we've come from five, six years ago till now. We've come a long way in the Muslim community, the Shia Muslim community specifically when it comes to mental health. And we also have a group here in Ottawa called the Serenity Islamic Mental Health uh, Awareness Initiative, where it was myself and a group of students who started this up after, unfortunately, a few young men took their lives here and, in Ottawa, and it really impacted the community. And so we started talking about prevention uh, as a form rather than um, looking at prevention, rather than trying to, I forget the, the, the expression now, but um, always looking at prevention rather than reaction, right? And that's a lot of the professionals in the community who were not mental health professionals, God bless them, they were trying to give, you know, psychoeducational presentations, but they were not mental health professionals. So this kind of spurred to develop this group called the Serenity Islamic Mental Health Awareness Initiative, where we started talking about psychoeducational workshops, bringing in professionals, whether talking about suicide, we brought in the director of the suicide at the local hospital, and she gave a wonderful presentation and customized it towards Muslims, right? We brought somebody and talk about rehab and drugs addictions. We had also Muslim mental health professionals, psychiatrists psychotherapists, social workers, who also came in and talked about healthy diets, you know, healthy nutrition, and a variety of different topics, abusive relationships. All year long, we had these workshops that led up to Canada's first mental health Muslim conference. And we didn't know that until we this was actually almost done where the media had actually labeled this as such. And it was a huge conference in the sense of first time of doing anything like that especially in our community that would shun away to talking about mental health. But we had people coming in from Toronto, which was four hours away. We had people coming in from Montreal, which was two hours away, coming to this wonderful, cute, little, but big conference at the same time, because our hearts and soul were just poured into really promoting this at a time where it still wasn't accepted. Alhamdulillah, this started the conversation and that's the, the, the logo, so to speak, or the motto, starting the conversation. And I would say the work through the serenity that inspired and encouraged other groups around the world, whether it's student groups, like we have the Beautiful Mind Project here, and other uh, groups as well within communities to really start the conversation. And of course, the work through the Muslim Council, I'm not shy attending banquets and conferences, whether it's the Nainawa conference, where, whether it's the Imam Rida Ziyara banquet here in Ottawa. And you know, when you have the questions to the Sheikh or the Sayyid at the end, I'm the one that says, so Sayyidna, what are your thoughts around, you know, mental health since it's such a taboo? That's how it started a few years ago. I remember at the Nainawa conference a few years ago, Sheikh Mohammed Al Halli from the UK was here, and you know, and they had questions at the end. There were hundreds of people in the audience, and we're all focused on Ashura and Muharram and Imam Hussein Ali Salam. What's a mental health question got to do with anything? But that's how you bring attention to taboo topics when you have huge audiences like that, and then you have a speaker who can connect it, right? And then that's how we got the ball rolling. And I would have to say after that, Alhamdulillah, I kept pushing. I had an agenda that this has to go out. Well, how do you start the healing with our communities if you don't talk about something when you're not talking about abuse, right? Child abuse, domestic violence, suicide, drug abuse, sexual assault, the list goes on and on, eating disorders, right? Anxiety, depression, medications, all of these things, like the Sayyid was saying, we need to destigmatize, we need to normalize, and also understand it is all a part of our faith. However, there's a lot of stereotypes and misconceptions, especially when it comes to shame, right? And especially when it comes to Allah is the only one you should be talking to, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can heal you. So let me give you this example. It's probably a joke. I always like to infuse humor because then it just clicks, right? So there's this guy who's stuck on an island and I'm sure you've heard this in different forms. He's stuck on an island. He can't get out. He's like, I'm going to rely on my God to get me off this island that I'm stranded on. So there's a helicopter that comes along and says, come on, we'll take you out. And he says, no, I refuse to go. Allah's going to help me. They leave. Then a boat comes along, a ship. Come on, come on board. You know, we're here to save you. He's like, no, I'm not coming on. God is going to save me. Finally, God tells him, I'm sending you all of these resources to help you from me, you know? And so this is the same thing when it comes to seeking support, when it comes to mental health support, right? Is that the doctors, the professionals, 
these are all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he's provided us these resources through knowledge and education and professionals who are taught in the field. And now we have Muslim mental health practitioners, right? People specializing and learning. There's so many people I know right now who are studying both Islamic studies, but also getting their diplomas, degrees, and education in counseling. For example, and he publicly speaks about it, Sheikh Noor Muhammad from Birmingham. He proudly talks about mental health. He's given excellent, excellent lectures on mental health, especially during majalis of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Who would have thought that you could link the two? But he did. And he publicly talks about taking courses so that he can become a therapist. You have Sheikh um, uh, Jawad uh, Muhammad Shamali as well, who studied, mashallah, a lot in the Islamic studies philosophy, but he's also now doing courses and learning how to be a therapist. Look at the beautiful marriage of the two, right? So I know I completely went off track here, but it's something I'm so passionate about. And I love it when I hear advocates like the, the Sayyid here who are saying that you need to have spaces dedicated to this in our centers to normalize it, just like you would at a church just like you would in other places at the university, at your doctor's office. It just makes sense to have that in our centers, right? But also to make sure that you have confidentiality. Now, so this wasn't, I wasn't planning on answering the question this way, but I just had to really reiterate what the Sayyid was saying. I understood this question in terms of healing amongst our communities with the Sunnis and different Muslims. Is that correct? So if that's the case, I'll quickly say, because I know I spoke a lot, that it does require to have that mutual respect of people who can understand, sure, we have differences, although the main differences are huge. And there's, I, I don't believe there's, you know, you can't get around, um, and I'll say it straight up, and I know we have people of different backgrounds here, but we have to be open as well and, and understanding. You can't get around the fact that Sayyida Fatima was hurt and killed by the same people who said that they were followers of the prophet. Like there's no denying history, right? You cannot deny that. Sometimes people are very harsh about these things and talk about that and you know curse other people, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what we're talking about here, but you also cannot deny history. And that can cause a lot of pain in people to say, but how can I be friends with somebody who believes that they can follow the killer of who killed my lady, right? And I remember as a university student, I struggled with that. And you know, sometimes I still do being honest and open about it. However, when we take a look at our Sunni brothers and sisters, a lot of people don't understand the history, don't understand what led to these divisions, what led to these differences. And of course the hate that we see these days, right? And the violence just because you are of this minority. And so there are many brothers and sisters of the Sunni background who do love the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, right? And do these Inter, in, is it inter? Yeah, inter, uh, interfaith kind of events, right? Where they host iftars together, where they host even in Muharram and Ashura, because there are understandings around that. There are lovers of the Ahlul Bayt who follow the Sunni sect, as contradictory as that may sound, right? We've had dialogues with people of these different backgrounds who are scholars as well, who are very loving towards the Ahlul Bayt. And I think we need to focus on these things to learn more in the name of the love this way, right? In the, lame, in the name of unity. What type of unity and, and how much more unified can we be in terms of what we're seeing in the world today, what's happening in Palestine, in Palestine, right? You have both Sunni, Shia, you have humanity lovers of different backgrounds. You have Jewish people, right? Who are saying, this is wrong. There's a unity there. And if you notice, and if you look at the history and the politics, where I know we're not getting into politics here, but if you look at this, some of the most biggest Shia, Shias are, are the ones who are supporting the cause of the Palestinians, right? If you, if you think about that, right? So what does this show you? This shows you there's a love, right? There's a unity here. And so we need to focus on these things when we talk about healing and bridging, is to look at the positives. Some of my close friends I have that are, are Sunnis and we joke and laugh and about the way we pray and stuff like that, but we've known each other for you know almost a decade or two so we can get away with that, but you can't do that with just anybody, right? There has to be a sense of respect and familiarity and things like that. And so I think when you have these types of relationships, that's when the healing can occur. When you have open dialogue with respect, because we've seen and you've seen those videos out there where people are hating on the other, are just calling each other out, and it's, it's just so full of anger and hate. And it's just, 
it's so opposite to what our own faith taught us, right? It's so opposite of what the Imams السلام, exhibited in the face of when they had the, uh, the oppression or when they had people hating on them, right? They showed us how to talk to people of different backgrounds, including enemies. Now, I'm not saying Astaghfirullah Sunnis are, are enemies here, no, but I'm saying in general, there were enemies of Islam, but look, even the enemy of Islam, look how the Imams behaved. So what does that tell you to how to behave with our brothers and sisters in faith, right? And in humanity. So I think this is how we can really continue the conversation around healing amongst our communities to have common causes. Look at our similarities rather than our differences because as soon as you get into the differences, it's gonna get heated, right? People can lose their temper, lose their heads. It's very easy to do that. Whereas if you focus on things that bring us together that are common, then you can bridge that understanding and then you can have those peaceful dialogues, inshallah. I will just add, sorry, I, I know this is, um, you, you, thank you so much, Sister, Sister Barak, for, for mentioning all those points and, and for acknowledging that there is now, you know, where we were 10 years ago or five years ago versus where we are now in terms of, from, from a Muslim scholar's perspective of understanding mental health, uh, I mean, we've, we've done strides and thank you so much for all of your contributions. I, I know uh, you sent us the link to the documentary, so I'm very eager to, to see what you've, uh, what you've accomplished, inshallah. But I, I, I would like your feedback, please, because I'm, I, I love this project and I would love to hear what people have to say because I'm so passionate about it. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. When you come to the camp, inshallah. We're thinking maybe possibly having it this year later, maybe in the winter, if, if, if God permits. I'm getting but, vaccinated, so I should be able to travel. I'm just <laughs> getting vaccinations for travels, really. <laughs> Inshallah, inshallah. Um, but you know, that, that pushed me a few years ago, my own journey, and then seeing, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So being almost oblivious to it, I think in a way, it was a blessing for me to go through some of those struggles, because I started to understand what, look, if I'm, you know, a practicing uh, scholar, you know, learned, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And I'm struggling with these things. And, and what about these, these kids, you know, I call them kids, right? Anyone who's, anyone who's born after 1990, right, is a kid to me. So no offense. But uh, um, that pushed me to want to further my education. So after I finished my education, you know, I was, I was doing my PhD, and I realized, I, I put a pause to it, my PhD. And I said, you know what, I want to, I want to study mental health. And so I, I studied, um, I started to, to study chaplaincy, I did chaplaincy studies. And Chaplaincy studies, obviously, there's, there's, it's sort of the intersection between spiritual health and, and mental health. Um, you know, as a chaplain, you're not a fully trained mental health professional like a psychotherapist or a li licensed marriage and family therapist. But there, there is an understanding of, um, uh, you know, uh, mental health and, and emotional health because that's part of the work of a chaplain is to help people heal in that regard. So I'm halfway there. Inshallah, I'll, I'll be complete with it. Um, but my, in the process of that, my wife also st started studying um, uh, to become a marriage and family therapist. And so she's, she's almost done as well. And we're always having these conversations side by side in our community with the youth. Um, you know, I'm going to start sending people now that I know this. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You're Alhamdulillah. my reference list now, inshallah. <laughs> but, but what I did want to say, what I did want to say, because it goes both ways, is that I've also had to tell people when I've counseled them that, listen, I've gotten you to the extent that my knowledge and my experience can get you to. You need to talk to a therapist. You need to talk to a licensed marriage and family therapist. And for some people, going back to the whole stigma thing, it's still so stigmatized that they don't understand why I'm telling them to do that. And I got to slowly like nudge them towards it. And I've had to, I've actually had to refuse, not, not, not turn people away, but refuse having conversations around certain issues because I know for myself, I know my limits that I'm not a fully trained marriage and family therapist or a psychotherapist. So I can't help them in the regard, in the way that they feel that they, that they truly deserve. And so for me to advise them on something that I know somebody else can better advise them in is me doing a disservice to them. And, um, and so I think there, there definitely needs, again, to reiterate that uh, that point that there needs to be destigmatization, and then there's also um, uh, there needs to be cooperation between, uh, I think, religious uh, scholars and, and and scholars of the faith, and also mental health professionals. You know, Sayyidina, it's great that you say that. Just to quickly put it in there, because there's a, a lot of people would go to the front line. I call our sheikhs and our scholars and alimas. 
I call them our frontline workers in our community. And I have for years because you were the first people, the people in our community go to for marriage problems, for issues with their kids, or if they're struggling spiritually, they come to you. And a lot of people, the sheikhs and the scholars and almas don't have the, the psychotherapeutic skills. They would have some chaplaincy, but then some will, say, will take on the cases and they don't have the skills. And so I, I think it, it, it's amazing that you're saying that, hey, you know, this is my limit right there. And you need to go see a psychotherapist. You need to see a psychiatrist, go to your doctor. And I, I hear that a lot from the scholars as well as say, hey, I can't do this. Okay, you've come to me because you feel there's a gin upon you or you're hearing things and I've helped you with that. You're still not well. You need to go see a psychiatrist, right? So th there also has to be that within uh, our scholars abilities to, and acknowledge because a lot of people don't want to turn people away or say yeah I can handle this I can do this when in reality you know people come to me for Islamic questions I'm like sorry I'm <laughs> I'm not a scholar please go to your local sheikh or alim and I'll send them to people like that uh, but I think that's cool that you know that people will come to one or the other to get the support but it's really important to know who the people are, where to go. And like you said, Nasi has an incredible support. I've worked with them over the years. I'm always endorsing and supporting what they do because now they actually, not only is it a crisis line now, but they actually are going to have therapists free of charge. And because the community realizes how important this is, they are putting money into building a center as we speak. So just wanted to, to put that in there. Please continue, Sayyidna. Alhamdulillah. No, I mean, that's that's such great news. And, and thank you for working with them. And obviously, we've we've had our share in the community. I, I remember uh, I remember the first uh, suicide that we had in the community. Uh, I, I uh, just I couldn't understand it. I could not understand it. And I remember the first time I heard about it, I just I I just burst into tears because I didn't know how to react. I, why would this happen? You know, I, I remember it was a, a young young girl. She was 13 years old, and uh, it was it was very violent. And um, you know, she had gone through some struggles and lost one of her friends. And the second time it happened again, it was like, why is this happening? And because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the conversations were almost non-existent. It was it was also um, it was almost torturous for 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 community leaders. To experience this because we had no perception of where do we point people towards you know other than giving them verses of the quran and uh, and all of that and obviously that's part of the spiritual healing process um there wasn't there wasn't much you know we didn't know about therapy or, or different techniques or um so th thank you so much for uh, being an advocate of that barakallahu bikum Sayyidina, do you have uh, ideas in terms of telling our youth in terms of how we can begin the healing within our community with the both the Sunnis and the Shia? What are your thoughts on that? Because I think that's where we're supposed to answer. Yeah, um, in, in in terms of the healing, I would say you know make use of the resources that that are available, um, but also you know come up with your own thing. I think if you if you study the tradition of you know. If you study the tradition of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt uh, you know, for me, for me particularly, uh, I believe that the du'as of the Imams, such as du'a Kumail, du'a Abu Hamza Thumali, some of the ziyaras of the Imams, alayhim salam, du'a al-Iftitah, these are gems in terms of um, mental health and spiritual health. I think if we just read them, you know, a lot of the times, like, I know for myself, I'm very guilty of this, du'a Kumail, you just kind of read it on a Thursday night, and you don't really ponder on, uh, and, and, and you don't really reflect on the meanings. If, if we can find a way to research, and I, and I know you said you've, you've, you've worked on this somewhat, but if we can truly research the, the Torah, the intellectual legacy of the Ahlul Bayt Alayhi Salam, and come up with, with ways to, to understand um, how to achieve spiritual healing and emotional healing through it, then that in itself can be a tool that that we can gift to the Sunni community, to the larger Muslim community, to the non-Muslim community. I've I've you know when I went to uh, graduate school, when I was doing my masters, it was at an Islamic school, but it was based at a Christian university. So um, some of the classes that I took there were Christians, Hindus, Zoroastrians, Catholics, people of different faiths. And I remember one time just reading an excerpt, sharing an excerpt 
um, from Imam Zain al-Abidin in English, not in Arabic. And there were people that were just, there was one person that just burst in tears. And, uh, you know, we take, we take so much of the, the Torah, the intellectual legacy for granted because it's so repetitive. But there is, there is so much healing in that, you know, ziyara, dua. I know for myself, again, going, just going back to my own case, um, Ramadan was, the month of Ramadan was really healing for me. One of the things that I did for myself that really helped with my own healing, I remember reciting Surah Yusuf every single night because I felt like I was in an emotional prison. I felt like I was in a, a spiritual prison almost. And I found so much comfort in, in, in Surah Yusuf. So study our legacy. If you need help from scholars and understanding, hey, what does this dua say? What does this say here? Reach out and, uh, and inshallah with that, we can create something that we can give as a gift to the world around us. Thank you. Thank you both for your responses. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the last question, inshallah. Um, and this is something that I think everyone has been feeling. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, there was the attack on the girls' high school in Afghanistan. So say the Shahada school, um, where primarily it was Shia Hazaras who were attending. Um, and also we touched upon Palestine. So I think that just, the Muslim community is facing a lot of heartbreak, um, feeling like the world is against us, feeling like we're being pitted against each other. So how can we take care of you know, ourselves, take care of our mental health, take care of each other, to not feel so hopeless and so heartbroken? Uh, Sister Barak, would you like to go first? S since you've asked me, I'll, I'll do that, but it's okay if... Uh... If you wanted to start, um, it ahead. definitely is as uh, as you were asking the question, sister. There's a sense of sadness I think that all came over us as we were remembering. As passionate as we were and proud of what we were talking about earlier, definitely there's that sense of you know feeling very solemn when when we remember what happened and then the the horrific images I think that we've all seen on social media that perhaps the main media has not highlighted and the need for us to show this even more, not necessarily the results of the violence, but the awareness, right? Uh, it, I recently I did a program specifically on how to deal with violent trauma and, and I would, uh, for those who would like to learn more to, to watch that. And uh, it was with another therapist and we got into detail specifically how to deal with this type of trauma. And, and I'll just give you kind of like a summary here. It, it is important to acknowledge and validate that we are just as important as any other other people, right? And although we may be a minority that can be targeted, our pain is valid, just like anybody else's pain, whether you are here, whether you are in Pakistan, where they're also being attacked, in Afghanistan, even in Iraq, in the last few years of the sectarian violence, where both uh, groups were targeted, and so on and so forth, right? Mainly the Shia, as we know. It, it, there's a sense of helplessness hmm? when you are here and it's over there. And we are connected because we are all part of the same umma. One part of our body hurts, the other hurts, right? And so we tend to feel helpless, but also know that your voice does have an impact, whether it is attending the protests for the Palestinian cause, whether it is bringing awareness to what happened to our young sisters in the form of art, in the form of poetry, in the form of any type of awareness that you could bring and say, hey, you know what? Their lives mattered. They are human beings as well. And you may not get necessarily the validation and acknowledgement that you're looking for through the main media, through people of different faiths and backgrounds. I had a client, for example, the other day, she's not Muslim, pure Canadian girl, she's dealing with her own mental health issues and bless her. She has a sister who's a convert, perhaps this is why she connects, but she has a convert sister. And her sister sent me salam, even though I don't know her. And she had heard I was sick and she sent prayers and I'm like, oh, God bless you. But look at this young woman who is absolutely disconnected from what's happening in Palestine and in Afghanistan. She's crying on the phone to me and saying, how can people not care? It was really incredibly touching, you know, as a person of Muslim background, hearing somebody of not Muslim background say, how can people not care? How can my rich friends here have all this money and not use it to help people? I don't have money and I'm using my student loans to give money to these causes to help. Amazing, when you hear this, 
This is empowering. This is part of healing. This, this helps your mental health in the sense that you don't give up hope on people out there that actually care about the Ummah being attacked, right? That you find this beautiful light of people everywhere, anywhere, but not everybody, right? So it's important to get that validation. If you are not getting that from people who are not connected and don't understand how over there affects us here, you definitely can find that within friends and family, right? We are all, most of us here in first world countries, right? Where we have first world problems. But I think as being as empathetic Muslims and compassionate and what our faith teaches is in the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Ahlul Bayt Alaihi Wasallam, they teach us that compassion, right? And give compassion to yourself as well, right? And this is what I've seen. I personally struggled with this as a professional in the last two weeks. I sent a message to my colleagues, right? And I said, I'm having a hard time today dealing with my clients with first world problems when I'm seeing this devastation taking a place in the other parts of the world where children are being murdered. Young girls are being attacked for trying to seek an education because they are a minority. It was very hard to get through the workday and acknowledging that, saying, hey, you know what? You're human, you're gonna feel, you're not gonna beat your full potential. At the same time, you know how we're all saying, keep sharing, keep sharing what's on social media as it's getting this global awareness, mashallah, and I can attest from the time when I was a child till now that we've never seen anything like this specifically when it comes, let's say, to the Palestinian cause and to attacks that happen in different parts of the world, the type of attention that it is garnering, right? Like it, that it, that's bringing a lot of attention through the power of social media. At the same time, as you are sharing, 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 you become somewhat almost very depressed when you see the images. It can have an effect on your soul when you see this type of destruction, human destruction, right? Again, you have to acknowledge that and perhaps take a step away and not look at so much of these images. You know what's happening, but still share at the same time. So there has to be a balance because your soul can be really disturbed and impacted by seeing such tragedy in front of you. And then that's a normal human response to when you see such trauma in front of you, right? So number one is validation and acknowledgement from yourself and others around you who understand the same things that you were going through. Number two, although you want to share and be, you know, bring awareness to everybody, at the same time, be compassionate by taking a step back and not bombarding yourself with such horrible, horrific images, right? Because that can take its effect on you, it can really, really destabilize you. But at the same time, you want to now, step three is reframe that energy rather than it being internal and feeling anger and perhaps hate towards others and so much um, even anger inflicted upon yourself which can cause a lot of pain right you want to externalize that and put it into action be productive with that anger right and using that anger for good right attending protests attending uh, meetings with your mps your members of parliament lobbying petitioning right? Bringing awareness to the violence that's happening to the Hazara people. This is not the first time. This has been happening for decades. If you read about their history, and I was taking a look at that the other day because I myself did not know much about their history, and they are a persecuted people, right? So it's important to educate and learn, and this is a way of how you can empower your mental health to take care of your mental health through this type of knowledge, just like we said right at the beginning, right? And so this proactive type of action is part of the prevention as well because you're using education and knowledge and you're not just sitting there being helpless you're doing something right when you're attending those marches and you're using your voice as one with your sunni brothers and sisters and people of humanity or if you're bringing awareness through writing an article through your local paper hey did you know this is what happened in this part of the world i actually did that recently and I'll share the article because I think it's really important to understand, see what is happening on the other side of the world and how we are connected to it here and how we can share this locally. And the Ottawa Citizen, which is our local newspaper here, was interviewing people a year later after the George Floyd murder is what has changed? What are the stories we are not hearing about? Because one of the gentlemen who was a black background said, I'm not going to turn to the Ottawa Citizen to see what's happening in my community. That's not where I turn to it. And that was very interesting to hear and see. And so they interviewed five people, including myself, to talk about what are we missing? And I'll put the article here for you to check after. But essentially, 
this is an opportunity to educate our communities in terms of what's happening over there and how it impacts us. When you take such action, like we said, acknowledgement, validation, number one, number two, compassion, even though you're giving that awareness and number three, being proactive, that's how you can empower yourself with these difficult types of situations and bringing awareness. And of course, constantly remembering them in your du'as, the power of du'as. I tell you, and I'm just wrap up quickly with this. The power of du'a is incredible. We've said this before, you've heard this before, you know, a, stra a stranger's du'a has power. We're always asking for it, but I think it's just lip service until you actually see it. I witnessed it firsthand recently when I was ill with COVID. I was told I had to be in ICU for a week. And my friend said, Barak, you need prayers. You're alone in the hospital. At that point, I was completely out of this world. I, I didn't care about what was happening. I was off social media and I didn't say anything about being sick. And my friend said, we need to get da'as for you. I'm like, sure, do whatever you want. I was halfway out of here anyways, my mind. And subhanAllah, remember I said, the doctor said I'd be in ICU for a week. That night, a few hours after the post went out on social media that Barak needs to ah, she's in ICU, et cetera, et cetera. That night they took me out of ICU. Incredible. The power of da'a, obviously medicine had a lot to do with it, but the power of da'a. And using that in, the, in these types of situations can help a lot, okay? So quickly, acknowledgement, validation, compassion, being proactive, and never forget the power of du'as and prayers for your fellow brothers and sisters, inshallah. Thank you both for that wonderful insight. Uh, Said, did you want to say something? I just wanted to add um, just one narration that I always think about uh, by the Prophet, peace be upon him. And thank you, Sister uh, Barak, for, for, for mentioning that. And obviously, our hearts always break whenever we hear about uh, something like this, and in, in, uh, whether it be in Afghanistan or, or in Gaza or Iraq or wherever it is in the world. And I'm always reminded of the hadith of the prophet, peace be upon him. We know that the prophet, peace be upon him, only had one child that outlived him. And that was Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, and not by much. We know that the prophet had children who died during his lifetime. One of those was Ibrahim, and Ibrahim was the son of Mari al qitliya And when Ibrahim died, now the prophet really loved Ibrahim. He was around the same age as his grandson, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There's a beautiful story behind that, but I don't want to take too long, but when the prophet, when, when Ibrahim passed away, the prophet, peace be upon him, said the following, and I'll just read the translation. He says, indeed, the eyes shed tears and the heart feels sorrow. What does that mean? The, the eyes shed tears and the heart feels sorrow. You can't necessarily control if you're going to burst in tears or not. You know, they talk about how, you know, girls cried in Titanic during that scene when Leonardo DiCaprio drowned and guys cried when Paul Walker died, you know, in the Fast and the Furious. Um, you know, you, you can't necessarily control your tears. You'll watch a movie that's complete fiction, your heart breaks and your tears drop. He says, yet we do not say anything except that which is pleasing to our Lord. Your departure, O Ibrahim, surely leaves us all deeply saddened. The prophet is affirming his emotions. He's saying, I'm deeply saddened. My heart is broken. I'm crying, yet I don't say anything except, except that which pleases our Lord. And it can be very difficult at times to hold our tongue. But I truly believe in the power of the spoken word. How do you describe yourself? You know, our words, they don't just, they don't just describe our reality. Our words create our reality. Our words are seeds that we plant. And Sister Barak can tell us better about this, but in terms of, I believe when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy, big part of that is controlling uh, your language and framing your language around your emotions. How do you process your emotions? What's the language? How do you describe yourself? So our hearts will be broken and we'll cry and we'll be deeply saddened. But what is what are the words that are coming out of our mouth? And I've found for myself that whenever I choose to describe my reality and create my reality through positive words, through uplifting words, no matter how chaotic the world around me is that does a great deal for my personal mental health and that rubs off you know the words that we speak is also energy that we put out into the universe it rubs off on our on our family our friends you know there's there's a book i think it's called uh seven and a half lessons about the brain or something like that and the author gave a, a really good ted talk and she talked about body budgeting and what body budgeting is is our words and our energy uh with that we help regulate other people's energy levels and they've, they've shown how someone who's 
um, in the ICU, um, you know, they, they've, they've gotten treatment where someone else has just put their hand on their hand and how that's, you know, changed uh, their heartbeat or something like that. Or if somebody is grieving, just sitting in close proximity and silent proximity, what that does to regulate their, you know, so-called body budget. So I, what I'm trying to say is that even though the world around us may seem chaotic and, uh, you know, just completely out of control, just remember that at the end of the day, you are in control of your words, you are in control of your thoughts, you are in control of your emotions. And you owe it to those people to keep, to keep yourself sane, to keep yourself moving forward, to keep yourself productive, rather than being debilitated uh, or, or, or allowing that feeling of sadness to just completely overwhelm you to the point of um, being debilitated. Sayyidina, can I just add with what you were saying inspired the image of Sayyida Zainab, I saw nothing but beauty, right? In the face of difficulty, she saw beauty and that just teaches us that despite how much tragedy you can see in front of you, there's a beauty and strength in it, just like how you were describing uh, the prophet responded to the death of his son, right? And of course, the saying, tafa'alu bil khair tajidu, right? As the prophet says, propagate that goodness, that positivity, this positive psychology right there. You will find it, inshallah. Yes, thank you so much, both of you, for your insight and resources and tips. Inshallah, it was very beneficial to all. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. And I just quickly want to um, share our resources, specifically um, BMPs. So let me quickly do that. So we have created a QR codes. Um, I tried to find some share resources right here. You can find it in the QR code and a regular resource directory where you can find Muslim therapists and counselors that can better understand our issues and what we're going through, inshallah. You can find that here. So I'll give you all a couple of uh, seconds to do that. Um, and inshallah, we'll move on. While well, y'all are doing that, um, that's the end of our event. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for coming. We hope that it was beneficial. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, to our two amazing speakers. Uh, I definitely learned a lot, and I felt like I could relate to a lot of what was being said. So really thank you for taking the time to help us plan this and, and taking the time to talk to us. Yes, thank you, everyone. And please follow us on our social media for, inshallah, future um, events. Thank you all. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu Thank you again uh, to the organizers. I know we went back and forth for a couple of months and trying to put a date together. So thank you for being patient with us. And um, thank you, Sister Barak. I, I, before this event, I know this is our first event, um, uh, you know, uh, basically on the same panel, but I, I had heard so many great things about you and had uh, listened to your videos and and whatnot. So thank you uh, for, for being a great resource and inshallah you're, you're endowed with great strength so that you can uh, continue to bless our communities, inshallah. Thank you. Bless, bless you, Sayyidina. Thank you for your kind words. And I've heard a lot of amazing things about you from your relatives uh, in London. So <laughs> yeah, I, I heard we're related somehow. I don't know. How, <laughs> I, you know, thanks for bringing that up. I forgot about that. Apparently our relatives of relatives are connected. We're all Karbala'is in the end, right? Yeah. But thank you so much, Sayyidna. And uh, please send my salam to the to your wife and uh, I, I'm amazed and so happy to hear that you are both studying further in this to, to be able to provide meaningful and culturally and religiously connected the supports for our community. This is amazing. Again, I'll, I'll, I wanna get your contact information for both of you so I can refer people because I'm always getting